Okay, hi, so in this video we're going to speak about infectious disease. So we're going to cover how we get it and where we get it from. So there are various different types of infectious diseases and you've probably heard of lots of them. Examples could even be the, the common cold all the way up to things like influenza, HIV and various other diseases like that. Now an infectious disease is one which you can pass on to someone else. The way that you pass it on is normally via a pathogen. Pathogen. So for an infectious disease to be infectious, we need something to be able to carry that disease. And that is collectively known as a pathogen. Now a pathogen is basically a microorganism which causes an infectious disease. Now these can come in various different types, uh, but the main two that we need to know are bacteria, bacteria and viruses, viruses. So bacteria and viruses are two very different things, but they both cause infectious disease. So what is a bacteria? Well, a bacteria is a single-celled organism. So remember that we are made up of trillions of cells. Bacteria only have one cell. So they're single-celled organisms, and they look... This is an example. It could just be a cell. So that's the nucleus. A lot of them have tails, and they can just swim around, and this is a bacteria. They exist as one cell. Now, it's important to note that not all of these bacteria do cause disease. Some of them are completely fine, and you've probably seen on commercials, uh, yogurts contain good, ba good bacteria. Good bacteria just means bacteria which doesn't hurt us and actually helps us. So we've got lots of bacteria at the moment in our gut. If we didn't have those bacteria there, then we would be in trouble. So they are good bacteria, but if a bacteria is a pathogen, that means it can cause disease. Okay, so how about a virus? Virus is very small. They're way smaller than even a bacteria. So bacteria is one cell. A virus is actually even smaller and it doesn't really normally look like it's alive. For example, a virus might just look something like this. It might just be a cube with legs. And that seems a bit odd, but viruses are very small. They're actually made of proteins, but they're not quite an entire cell. So there is, there is a lot of argument about whether a virus is alive. I'm not going to go into that. Just consider it alive for now. But a virus can infect us, of course. It can also affect bacteria. A virus is so small that it can infect literally any other type of life form. There are various different viruses which will only affect plants, only affect animals, only affect bacteria, fungi... They do have a lot of different potential targets. Right, now that's all well and good, but how do these pathogens actually cause disease? Well, there are various different ways, but the fundamentals are pretty much the same. So how they cause disease is they reproduce rapidly within the body. That's us, of course. If a bacterial virus gets into our body, it will reproduce rapidly and it can also release harmful toxins. Harmful toxins. And so these things will reproduce, uh, so we will end up with loads of bacteria or loads of viruses inside our body and this will end up causing damage. If they release toxins which are actually toxic to us, that's just like if we took in poison by eating it or drinking it, uh, the bacteria or the virus are releasing toxins which are going to damage the inside of your body. Importantly, viruses don't really release toxins very often. Because they're so small, they don't have the same metabolic processes as bacteria do, so they don't really release toxins very often. So from virus to go there, it's pretty rare. However, viruses will reproduce extremely quickly. They will get inside your cells and they will use your own cells to reproduce them. Whereas bacteria, 
They don't normally get inside your own cells because they are a cell themselves. So they will reproduce sort of in the bloodstream or wherever they're going to be, but they won't actually get into our cells. And so bacteria reproduce slower than viruses. Right, so the next obvious question is how do we actually contract these diseases? How do we take in these pathogens? So contraction, we can contract these diseases by different methods depending on what it is. So droplet infection is where you might sneeze, you might breathe out. Um, even when we breathe and it doesn't look like we're spitting anything out, there are tiny particles coming out of our mouth every time we breathe or out of our nose. And these will travel in the air. If we sneeze, they'll travel in the air very fast. And obviously if someone else breathes those particles in, they could contain bacteria or viruses and then they will contract the infection. So you've passed on that infection. Another method of infection is direct contact. Direct contact. So some diseases, it's enough for your skin to just come into contact with someone else who has the disease. An example of this, obviously a not very nice one, is genital herpes. So genital herpes is an example of that one. If someone with herpes comes into contact, so their skin comes into contact with someone else's skin, then they can pass that disease across. Okay, another one will be a break in your skin. So a break in the skin, slash blood. So for example, if you probably heard of dirty needles causing infection. So if there are people with a drug problem, specifically things like heroin, needles which are not sterilized properly can actually cause the transmission of blood-bound diseases. One of those is HIV. So HIV is an example of this. HIV travels in the blood and it can be transmitted via the blood. It can't be transmitted via sexual intercourse and it can't be transmitted by sneezing and breathing and things like that. Okay, and lastly, food and drink. Food, drink. You'll know that food and drink have a sell-by date and a use-by date, and if we don't adhere to that, then we are at risk of contracting an infection. Bacteria obviously need to eat just as we do. They don't eat in the same way, of course, but they do need to take in nutrition. Bacteria will grow on your food, and when they do, that is when we say that the food has gone off. If we do not cook food or we let food go off, then we could potentially be eating or drinking harmful bacteria, which will cause us problems. So that's a lot of ways that we can contract an infection. So why aren't we infected all the time? Why don't we always have different diseases and illnesses all the time? Well, it's because we have defenses. We have defenses against these things. So droplet infection, we, when we take in a breath or, or anything, we have what's called mucus, mucus lining our airways. That mucus will trap pathogens which are breathed in. And the mucus then is carried to the gut and our stomach acid will kill the bacteria or the viruses that are taken in. So stomach acid, it's quite a strong acid and so the bacteria normally can't survive in the stomach acid. So that actually stops us getting infected all the time because there are pathogens in the air that we breathe in every single day. Now direct contact against genital herpes there isn't a lot of bodily defense but against other less serious diseases which are harder to contract our skin is a great defense. So our skin stops things from outside our body getting into our body basically and so various diseases which could get in um, and obviously cause us problems are stopped by the skin. Now if we cut ourselves then you will know that we form a scab and our blood will clot. This is so that we basically stop 
the blood from being exposed to the outside environment because your body, of course, realizes that microbes or different types of pathogens, sorry, can get into your blood and cause you a lot of problem. So your blood has evolved a mechanism to close up the blood as quickly as it can. And this is why when you have a deep cut, it's so important to wrap it up, bandage it, protect it as quickly as possible. Because if that doesn't happen and your blood can't clot because the cut is so deep, then it is very likely to, keep, to be infected by pathogens which you can find just in the air. And finally, our food and drink, uh, we can protect ourselves from bacteria found in our food and drink in pretty much the same way as we do with droplet infection because our stomach acid will kill most harmful bacteria. Not all of it, but most of it. Now, all of these defences I've mentioned are known as first-line defences. They stop you contracting an infection, they stop the pathogen from reproducing in your body before it's even began, so the pathogen doesn't have a chance of causing the disease. So these are known as the first line of defence. Okay, what I'm going to talk about quickly now is the second line of defence. So second line of defence. Now this is going to involve what is known as the immune system. The immune system. Now the immune system comes into play once we have already uh, been breached, if you like. The first line of defense has been breached and a pathogen has made its way into the bloodstream. So pathogen is present. So once the pathogen is present, you know, it wouldn't really make sense for us to just say, oh, well, we're infected now, let's just give up. Our immune system is a way that we can recover from an infection and get rid of it. And this involves your white blood cells. So your white blood cells. So your white blood cells can perform various different tasks depending on which type of white blood cell it is and exactly what type of pathogen we're dealing with. So let's say that this is our white blood cell and we have a pathogen, let's draw that in green, we have a pathogen which is floating around causing damage in the body. I'm going to make this blood cell a bit larger because normally they are quite big. So like this. Now this white blood cell will be buzzing around in your blood, traveling around and then it will see this pathogen. It thinks this pathogen is not meant to be in the body and one thing it can do is physically ingest the pathogen. So what happens there is the membrane of the white blood cell basically opens to allow the pathogen to enter. So the pathogen is pretty much being eaten by the white blood cell. So like this, pretty much being eaten, and that is known as ingestion. Sorry, ingestion. There you go, that's my bad spelling there. It's with a G, I-N-G-E-S-T-I-O-N. -E ingestion, it's basically eating the pathogen, it destroys it, and then the pathogen is dead and it can't do anything more. Now, white blood cells can also produce things known as antibodies. You've probably heard the term before, antibodies. So we're going to say an antibody just looks like this. It's got this Y shape. It's pretty accurate. So this is an antibody. And let's say that a white blood cell has produced this guy. Now a pathogen will have things on its surface known as antigens. And they are just pretty much selectable markers or just proteins which are on the surface of a pathogen letting you know that that pathogen is what it is. It's almost like our fingerprint. So our fingerprints tell you who we are. This antigen will tell you that this is a pathogen. So this marker is known as the antigen and it's found on the pathogen. We produce billions and billions of different white blood cells all the time and they all have different, slightly different shapes at the end. And let's say that this white blood cell fits. It will be traveling in our blood and it will come across the antigen. So like so. And look, it fits. 
These antibodies basically tell us we have been infected, there is a pathogen here, and then we can kill that pathogen. So we don't have to directly eat the pathogen, if you like, or ingest the pathogen here. The antibodies can do most of the work for us, find the pathogen, and then we can destroy them like that. So this is an antibody. Okay. And lastly, what if this pathogen is thinking, hang on, I really do want to infect you here. Um, and so it's going to start producing toxins. And so it's going to give out toxins. So the antigen, sorry, the pathogen, not the antigen, releases toxins. So these are toxins. Our white blood cells can release things known as antitoxins. So antitoxins, they might look something like this. Uh, that's a bad drawing, but this will be an antitoxin. And the antitoxin will recognize the toxins. The toxins would normally bind to our cells or attack our cells in a certain way and cause us damage. Whereas an antitoxin is going to find the toxins and cover them up. And this will end up breaking down the toxins, meaning that they are not harmful to us anymore. And therefore, the toxins are not affecting us. And so the antitoxins are released and they stop the toxin from causing us damage. So these are three different ways in which our white blood cells in our immune system protect us against pathogen infection. Okay, so I hope that's helped clear up what a pathogen is exactly and our defenses against them different types of infection and what our immune system can do after being infected in order to create that second line of defense. So if you do have any questions then please do email me using the link below or write a comment in the comment box and I'll be sure to get back to you. But I look forward to seeing you in the next video.